Okay, I believe we are live. I'm looking at my screen and say, yes, we're on the clock. Uh, so we're going to continue with our lecture guide here. And just a minute at a place called Fort Henry, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, which we're going to take a look at. Uh, remember, I told you yesterday, we're talking about two theaters of war, the war in the east, uh, Virginia along there, and then the war in the west, Tennessee, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, all that, that area there. And what we're focused on right now is the war in the west, because you have to have two parallel timelines. Remember that in July of 1861, the Union suffered defeat on your sheet there that you first been asked his first bull run, and that was a Confederate victory. And Irwin McDowell, who had been in command of the Army of the Potomac, was fired and has been replaced by George McClellan. And George McClellan is going to take almost a year training the Army of the Potomac to get it ready for combat. And nothing, nothing's happening. Meantime, there will be activity out west. And the first major engagement of the Civil War is going to take place in April of 1862, which we're going to look at today, but set the stage for that. And the timing of things and how things happen that actually changed the course of history and how what people saw how this how this war is going to turn out, but let's look at first at Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. Uh, what they are, I've got a map here. We're going to find them right here, right here. Here's the Tennessee Kentucky border, right there. You'll see Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson. Now, what they are is they they guard the arteries of the Tennessee and the Cumberland River. You have uh, you have the Tennessee River right here. And then you're going to have the Cumberland River right here and then the city of Nashville right down here or the capital of Tennessee. The Cumberland River flows through downtown Nashville today and the Tennessee River. But these two forts guard the entrance into Tennessee. They're Confederate held forts and they guard the entrance into Tennessee uh, from Kentucky. And even though Kentucky is a slave state, Kentucky has not left the Union. They're still part of the United States. And our little known general, who's not general, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, who had won a small uh, victory at a place called Cairo at the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers at the bottom of Illinois, had been promoted to a brigadier general. So now he's a one-star general. And he's going to be put in charge of uh, taking these two forts. By And if they can take these two forts, uh, uh, and remember the Union has gunboats and a Navy, and they'll be able to sell these gunboats up to Tennessee and the Cumberland River, down the Tennessee River into Tennessee, and then the Cumberland River, Cumberland River into Nashville, the capital the state of Tennessee. Now, uh, on February 6, 1862, Grant is going to reduce Fort Henry. And most of these people are going to escape. Most of the garrisons are going to be allowed to escape, or they're going to be able to escape in a snowstorm and go the, uh, the 30 or 40 miles over to Fort Donaldson on the banks of the Cumberland River, where Grant will lay siege to the uh, Fort uh, Donaldson there. The uh, Confederates have a garrison of about 15,000 men in this fort, but Union gunboats sailing up and down the Cumberland are going to pound it in submission. And the commander of Fort Donaldson is a guy named Simon Bolivar Buckner. Now, Simon Bolivar Buckner had been the roommate of Ulysses S. Grant at West Point. So here these two guys were college roommates. Now they're on opposite sides. Buckner for the Confederates and Grant here for the Union. But the fort is going... They, there's nothing they could do. They're completely surrounded. And so Buckner's going to send a message out to his old college room. He's my buddy. We can cut a deal here. And he says, I'd like to talk terms of surrender. And Grant says there will be no terms of surrender. There's only going to be unconditional surrender, which means you don't get to dictate anything. Just surrender. So uh, the term unconditional surrender Grant is going to stick with him, and he's going to get that nickname. You know, U.S. Ulysses Simpson Grant, U.S., but they're going to change his name to Unconditional Surrender Grant. Now, remember our timeline here. So we've had a small victory at Cairo, Illinois, by Grant. We've had Fort Henry reduced, and now the surrender at Fort Donaldson. The Cumberland River is open in February of 1862, and the capital Nashville falls to the Union. Meantime, out east, nothing's been happening. The only news that they have out there that Abraham Lincoln has is the loss at First Bull Run. Henry Halleck is the chief of staff of the United States Army, and he hates Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, and so when Lincoln starts to ask, like, who is this guy? Uh, he, he's winning. Uh, and how he's, oh, he's nothing. He's not. He's a drunk. He doesn't do much. He's much as he's got lucky or something. So you know, he, he's just he's a drunkard, Mr. President. That's what you have to understand. And Lincoln asks Halleck, well, what does he drink? He goes, I think his uh, preference is, is, is whiskey. 
And so Lincoln tells Halleck, here's what I want you to do. I want you to buy a bunch of cases of whiskey and send them out to all my generals. Because maybe if they'll start drinking, maybe they'll start fighting too. And in the end, uh, he was joking, by the way, and in the end, he'll give, he'll promote Ulysses S. Grant to Major General and give him his second star. So now Ulysses Grant has two stars on his shoulders, Major General, and he's going to become, start to catch the eye of Abraham Lincoln. And he's also going to start to become a name in the papers because he's winning. Now, his opponent is, remember, I talked about Albert Sidney Johnston yesterday. Albert Sidney Johnston of the Texas Revolution, a favorite of Jefferson Davis, uh, been a career military officer guy, uh, is is going to pull a stunt like Sam Houston did at San Jacinto. And remember, Stan, Sam Houston pulled the stunt that the Duke of Wellington did with Napoleon in 1815. So all these guys, this history cycle keeps repeating itself. So what's going to happen is you have the state of Tennessee right here. Uh, so here is the state of Tennessee right here. Here's the border down here, the Mississippi-Alabama border with Tennessee, Kentucky up here. And over the next two months, Albert Sidney Johnson is going to refuse to engage Ulysses S. Grant. He's basically just going to retreat down the Tennessee River here, the Tennessee River Valley, refusing to engage Ulysses S. Grant in the Union Army. And a lot, his second command is a guy named P.G.T. Beauregard. Remember, P.G.T. Beauregard was the guy who was at the first cannon at Fort Sumter. P.G.T. Beauregard was also one of the generals victorious at First Manassas First Bull Run, and now he's out west, and he's second in command to Albert Sidney Johnson. And P.G.T. Beauregard thinks he should be in command. Like He's like, I'm the one that's got the skins on the wall. I'm the one that's had these victories. This guy hadn't done anything. And as a matter of fact, he refuses to engage the enemy, and he keeps retreating. But like what Houston did with Santa Ana and the Mexican army, Johnson is going to do with Ulysses S. Grant and the Union Army. And over the course of the next two months, he's going to slowly retreat across the state of Tennessee, down, down the Tennessee River. Now, this is one place that's very unusual geographically in the United States, is that the Tennessee River flows to the north through the state of Tennessee, where it dumps into the Ohio River. Uh, and so that's most rivers flow to the south, but this one winds around through Tennessee, comes through Chattanooga, uh, Knoxville, Chattanooga, and then down to through Mississippi and Alabama, and then down into the down into the uh, Ohio River, uh, hundreds of miles away. But it's it's an unusual phenomenon where, as you head south, the river's flowing to the north. And so, as Grant pursues, and then Johnson refuses to engage, just like Santa Ana, the Union Army gets spread out. They get spread out because no, they're refusing to engage and fight. And if you remember. Sam Houston was taking a lot of criticism. Well, we need to fight. We need to fight. He's like, no, I'm going to pick the ground of my choosing, just like the Duke of Wellington did. And so now Albert Sidney Johnson's like, I'm going to pick the ground uh, of the choosing because it was this whole thing that's about territory. You've got to protect territory. And Albert Sidney Johnson was actually kind of a visionary. It was it's not about territory. It's not the fact that they have Nashville. It's the fact that they have an army and that I have to crush this army, but I have to do it on terms where I can win. And so he's going to retreat across right over the uh, Mississippi border into a town called Corinth, Mississippi. So on the map here, here's Corinth right here on the Tennessee, Mississippi border. And the Union Army is spread out 15 to 20 miles here along the Tennessee River. And there's a little place here called Pittsburgh Landing uh, with a little church on it called Shiloh. And what Johnson's going to do, he says, now's the time to strike. He's got them spread out. And he wants to have the element of surprise. And so on the night of April or the afternoon of April 5th, 1862, he's going to issue five days of rations to his troops. Now, rations for the Confederate Army were pretty spare and Spartan. They were issued what was called hardtack. And all hardtack was, was you took some, uh, some hog fat or grease and melted it and got it hot and it took flour or something, some kind of breadcrumb and you poured it in with a grease and then let it cool. And then you would get a cracker about that thick and you would just break this cracker off. And that was what was called hardtack. So it's flour mixed in with bacon grease or uh, hot lard or something. And that was the issue where the Union Army was actually very well fed. They had plenty of supplies where the Confederate Army wasn't. And so these guys are hungry. A lot of them don't even have shoes. And so if I'm an 18 and 19 year old soldier, and I'm issued five days rations of hardtack, and I'm hungry, and I'm knowing I'm going into combat tomorrow. 
what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to eat it all, which is what they did. Because like, what's the point if I get killed tomorrow and I'm, I at least get, at least die with a full belly on on here? And so a lot of them will go ahead and eat all their supplies and rations. And on early morning of April 6, uh, 1862, the Confederates are going to be pushing through a place called Fraziersfield towards the Union encampment on the banks of the Tennessee River at Shiloh. Now, what happened here was is military one on one is you always leave yourself an avenue of retreat. But the Union Army had thought the Union Army had thought that the Confederate Army didn't want to engage, so they become very lackadaisical, I guess, with their uh, preparations and their defense. And so, uh, what's going to happen here is is that about at about dawn, about dawn, the Union camp is just starting to stir, and breakfast is being prepared: bacon, eggs, jams and jellies, biscuits in the frying pan. And so as this assault begins uh, at dawn, a complete surprise. The Union Army's caught completely off guard. The Confederates come crashing out of the woods and start to storm through the Union camp. And these guys literally just drop everything and run for the river, uh, wanting to get away. But here's a little anomaly of history, just an odd moment. I'm starving and I'm hungry. And as I push through and I see eggs, biscuits, jams and jellies, bacon, these guys, out of just pure hunger, just like, they stop. They stop and literally eat breakfast. A 15-minute delay here because they were hungry and starving. Uh, stopped the advance and the attack. And it allowed William to come to Sherman to form a line about 200 yards away to where he could put up a defense. Now, they're good. the Confederates are still going to have the numbers and the element of surprise. But because of this delay... There was, there's a, in the center of the line, there's a sunken road where they're able to be put up a defense. Uh, it's going to be called the hornet's nest. Imagine if they had not stopped and eaten. Well, if they hadn't stopped and eaten, the, that they would have been defeated. The Union would have been driven into the Tennessee River, and Ulysses S. Grant would have been humiliated, and Ulysses S. Grant would have never been in command in 1865, and Ulysses S. Grant would have never been president of the United States. But the story's not over. Uh, so as they press on this attack, you have in the, you have the you have the Tennessee River here, the Union here, and what happens is the Confederates are pressing them towards the river, pushing them back. Uh, it, it ends up being like a horseshoe, but in the middle of this horseshoe, with their back against with the Union, with their back against the river, and the Confederates attacking this way, in this horseshoe here in the middle is a place called the Hornet's Nest, where a guy named General Rugles uh, is, uh, excuse me, Benjamin Prentice is hanging, holding his ground. And he'll hold for six critical hours here. Now, it's called the hornet's nest because if you've ever fired a black powder weapon or uh, heard a black powder weapon, and you've been right, when the bullet starts to slow down, you can actually hear it and it buzzes, it does that, and it buzzes like a hornet. And when you've got hundreds of bullets flying through the air there, the, uh, the, that's, why, that's why it got its name, that's why it got the name the hornet's nest. Now, so again, you have the Tennessee River here. You have the Union line and a horseshoe here with its back to the river, nowhere to retreat, and you have the Confederates attacking this horseshoe. Down here on this side of the horseshoe here is Albert Sidney Johnson in a place called the Peach Orchard, and he's pressing the attack, and he's like, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Even though we stopped for breakfast, we can still do this. If we, can, if we can break through this line down here, we can flank them, come behind them, and we win this, we win this battle, and we defeat the, uh, the Union Army out the west here. At about one o'clock in the afternoon, as he's as he's pressing the attack, he's on his horse and he's exhorting his men like, "Let's go, let's go, let's go!" And all of a sudden, he's gonna he's gonna get dizzy, and he's gonna look down and he's gonna look at his left boot, and he's gonna see blood just pumping out of his left boot. He was so full of adrenaline, pressing thing, he didn't even realize he'd been shot in the back of his leg. Uh, now. This was a wound that he could have survived, but you have a major artery that runs down both your legs. It's called the femoral artery. And it's about, it's about that big. And if this thing gets cut, you've got maybe two, three minutes at most, and then you bleed out and you bleed to death. Uh, and so you have to get a tourniquet on these things and apply it to, so that you don't bleed to death. But by the time Albert Sidney Johnson saw this, he had lost so much blood that he's becoming dizzy because he's gonna, he's about to pass out from loss of blood. And, the last thing that said to him is his aide looks at him and goes, and he goes, General, are you hurt? And Albert Sidney Johnson says, yes, I fear seriously. And he'll fall off his horse. He's taken down a, a creek bed where he dies. Now, Albert Sidney Johnson is dead. 
His second command, if you remember, is a guy named PGT Beauregard. PGT Beauregard, remember, thought he should be in charge. Remember, PGT Beauregard didn't like this plan of attack of Albert Sidney Johnston. He thought it was all wrong. But now he'll find he'll get word about 3 p.m. in the afternoon that uh, that Johnston is dead and that he now has command of this army. And he's like, great, I'm in command. I'm going to win my way. And about 4 o'clock in the afternoon on April 6th with the Union Army, with this with backed up on the banks of the Tennessee River and the hornet's nest has fallen now and one more big push and they can drive the Union Army to the Tennessee River and win a major victory, PGT Beauregard stops the attack because he has plans on how he wants to win tomorrow because he wants it to be his victory, not Albert City Johnson's victory. What an idiot. Uh, he'll, t- he'll send a telegraph to Richmond that night and said that victory is won. It, it would be one tomorrow, and I'll clean this up, and I'll be the victor. Meantime, Ulysses Grant, who had been about nine miles away, uh, will take, take a boat down to uh, what's left of the Union Army, backed up against the uh, the Tennessee River. And so the story goes that he was sitting under this oak tree, and a thunderstorm had rolled in, spring storms uh, rolled in, and he's sitting under this tree talking to General Sherman, and he says, what's your and asked him, what's your plan? What's your plan tomorrow? And Ulysses S. Grant is calmly smoking his cigar and says, we're going to lick him tomorrow. That's what we're going to do. And a bolt of lightning strikes this tree. Then he sends it and splits it and crashes. And they say, Grant never flinches. He just never flinches. The combination of this storm and then Union gunboats all night long are going to be shelling the Confederate position. So guys are sleeping out in thunderstorms and rain. And then not only that, you have, gun, you have, uh, you have shells dropping everywhere. So here on your study guide... As we look at this, as I told you, we looked at the breakfast, the peach orchard, the hornet's death, the untimely death. There's going to be a famous quote that's going to come out of this that says uh, that a lot of these guys said, "I'm just going to, I'm just, I'm going to die today." And a Confederate officer tells his boys, "Fill your canteens, boys, uh, and drink hearty because you're going to be in hell before midnight. You're going to die. You're going to die this day." So as you look at your list there, you see these things that we're talking about as we go down. Now, Don Carlos Buell, that you see there. Got word. Grant was so sure that um, that Johnson didn't want to fight that he had actually peeled off thirty thousand men under the command of Don Carlos Buell and sent them to Nashville. They just the day before, you guys go on to Nashville and garrison there. We don't need you. Uh, Don Carlos Buell will get word that an attack is underway at a place called Shiloh, Pittsburgh Landing. He'll countermarch or reverse and march back towards the field. Now you have the Tennessee River here. You have the battle on this side and on the other side of the bank, because the Tennessee River is about a mile wide. On the other side of the bank, at about midnight on April, the night of April 6th, Don Carlos Buell and 30,000 fresh troops will arrive. All night long, Union gunboats will ferry these, this army across the river here. So that as dawn breaks on April 7th, 1862, 30,000 fresh Union troops are, wait, are ready to attack. I'm suspecting PGT Beauregard, who thinks that he's going to be able to just to mop this thing up on the 7th and carry the day. And that's not the case. Don Carlos Buell and Lucius Grant orders a counterattack. They'll charge and, and they'll surprise the Confederates. Where well, the Confederates had surprised the Union the day before, now the Union surprises the Confederates with these 30,000 fresh troops. And they'll drive on the 7th, they'll drive the Confederates off the battlefield and drive them all the way back into Mississippi. And now you have in this, you have in this battle, Ulysses S. Grant winning a major engagement. But when they start to tally up the dead in two days, in two days, over 24,000 men are killed and wounded. And there's more men killed and wounded in this than all the other American wars combined. So you take the American Revolution, the War of 1812, the Black Hawk Wars, these little skirmishes. If you add up all the killed and wounded in those wars, they don't, they don't even match what happened in two days at Shiloh in 1862. And then you also have another problem here, which is disposal. You've got hundreds of corpses laying around in the, in the human sun. So what do you do with them? Well, what they did with the Union soldiers was they buried them in a, and created a cemetery there. It's still there today on the banks of the Tennessee River. And with the Confederate dead, it's like, what do we do? And if you go visit the Shiloh battlefield today, it's one of the great ones to visit because it's out in the middle of nowhere. and You've got to be going there. But you actually can go out on this battlefield and it's pristine. It's exactly like it was in 1862. And you can really get a, a feel of what the battle looked like. 
But what they did with these guys is they dug massive burial trenches and just break these guys up like leaves and throw them in. And so you'll have a trench. If you go there today, there's a burial trench in this trench, 900 Confederate troops in this trench, 800 in this trench. And you have these trenches just scattered across the battlefield. Uh, and it was just a mass grave burial. And for a lot of widows and sons and daughters that wanted to claim their Confederate father off the field, it was like, Grant's like, I'm sorry, too late. And so these people were no body to claim. They, don't even, they just know they're in one of those trenches somewhere, and which caused a lot of resentment uh, down south towards the view of the North. They saw this inhumane, said, oh, you had time to bury your guys individually, but our guys, you just rake them up like leaves and throw them into the trench. Now, what this does, though, in repercussions is Grant, he escapes. He, he's, he's fortunate here, but he gets a massive victory against the Confederacy. But Jefferson Davis' first pick to be commander of the Army of Northern Virginia is now dead, Albert Sidney Johnston. And in the end, it's going to fall to Robert E. Lee. And there's a lot of what ifs. What if Albert Sidney Johnston hadn't been killed? What if they hadn't stopped for breakfast? Uh, as I told you, Ulysses Grant is not president of the United States. What if Albert Sidney Johnston takes command of the Army of Northern Virginia East and we never know who Robert E. Lee was? Uh, all these what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. Uh, but an interesting side note about Albert Sidney Johnston, if you go to Austin, Texas today, and you go to the Texas State Cemetery, which is where historical figures in Texas are buried, uh, Tom Landry, the Dallas Cowboys, is buried there. Um, you've got Susanna Dickinson of the Alamo buried there. Stephen F. Austin buried there. Uh, American sniper Chris Kyle is buried there. To be buried there, you have to have either been in Texas government or the Texas legislature has to pass something to allow you to be buried there. But if you go visit it today, you see a lot of the headstones. But in the center of the cemetery is this big glass case. Uh, and if you look in the glass case, is a massive sarco marble sarcophagus with a guy reclined, laying back like he's just taking a nap. And that's the grave of Albert Sidney Johnson. Uh, he was so revered. And then you'll see a lot of the Confederate dead buried in him. Nobody's even really heard of the, who this guy is. But 160 years ago, everybody knew who he was, especially in Texas as a hero of the revolution and he was supposed to be in command. And it's one of those things of lost when he died. It was like, what if, what if Albert Sidney Johnson hadn't been killed? All right. That's a good place to stop. We'll talk about Nathan Bedford Forrest and Vicksburg uh, in our next lecture. So I hope things are going well. Uh, miss you guys and make sure you're filling out your study guide. And if you have any questions, email me or I'll be zooming Friday from 1230 to 120. If you're not unsure of something, you need me to go over something again, but, uh, there it is. Hope all is well, and we will um, hopefully see you soon. Bye.